You don't like sideways. Hmm? Doesn't want me to go sideways. Yeah. I think it's whatever. I think it's fine. I don't think it's gonna work well if I switch it. Yeah. We're good. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. This is our first in-person event and we're so excited to be here. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging um, that we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. And this land is still home to many diverse First Nations and I hope we all take a moment to consider that. Thank you so much to MKG for having us here in their beautiful gallery. I will ask all of you to take one step away from the paintings um, so that nothing bad happens. Um, they're gorgeous paintings and I feel like they're the perfect paintings to, uh, to be the background for a book called Boat. Um, so we just wanna make sure that they aren't damaged in any way. So thank you to Michael for having us. Um, what else should I tell you about? Uh, well, I should tell you to buy a book um, and while you're at the book table, um, you should sign up for our newsletter so you hear more about events like this. Um, the books you should buy are include, include both by Lisa Robertson, which we are launching today, but also Lisa will be in conversation with Derek McCormack, who recently published Judy Blaine's obituary, which you must own. So please also consider buying one of those. So at Coach House, we have published six books by Lisa Robertson starting in 2009. And working with Lisa remains one of my greatest sources of pride for what we've been doing at Coach House. I think that she's absolutely a genius and um, I'm honored to be able to have her books on our list. And Boat, um, I'm not even gonna tell you how Boat came to be because I think that'll be part of the conversation. Um, but it's, it's as, you know, it's exemplary Lisa and uh, I think that you'll love it. And with her to talk is Derek McCormack, author of many beautiful and, um, Derek, how would you describe your work? Outrageous. 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 And I think that they're going to have, they have a lot of amazing things in common, being both brilliant writers and um, like fashion icons. So they both have like, lots of things to talk about. and. I'm going to invite them to come up here and just uh, talk for a while. I think Lisa's going to read first, right? Lisa will do a little reading. Sure. Yeah, sure. And just yeah. a short reading, and then we'll get Derek up here and we'll um, do, some, do some chatting. It's all pretty informal. So. for an introduction that uh, choked me up for a moment. <laughs> I had to focus on my breath, come back to the, to the room that you're all in, and um, it's really such a privilege and joy to be here together in person um, and not be um, sitting at home in front of a Zoom screen. So um, I appreciate that you all had similar sentiments. So this is um, a great celebration to um, have a chance to talk together and uh, hang out and look at each other and laugh and all of that. Um, this, I guess, can I take off my mask for a quick risk without being, okay. I think it might be a bit clearer for reading. Um, Please read loudly so everybody can hear back here. Okay. Um, this, this book, Boat, is um, the third in a sequence of um, books, the first of which was called Rousseau's Boat, um, 2003 or four, I believe. It was a chat book with Nomados in Vancouver, um, um, Meredith Quartermain's small press. Um, 
the second iteration of what by then was becoming a project, which wasn't the initial intention, uh, was called R's Boat, just the letter R. Um, and it was published by University of California Press in 2009, I think. And um, um, Alana and I started talking about reprinting <coughs> that volume because it had never really been very present in Canada, having been published by California Press, for whom the Canadian reading public was um, um, not considered an important market. And that never quite sat well with me, although I was pleased to have been published at that time by that press. So I was really happy when Alana thought it was a good idea to reissue the book, and we got permission from University of California Press to do that. But we thought, if we're going to reissue it, we might as well renew it and make it a new book. Um, so I went um, back into the material, which is to say scads, stacks and stacks of just my regular notebooks that I keep for reading, teaching, researching, just sprawling this and that that pleases me or that I want to remember. And um, I added two new poems to the project. Um, but because there were many, many more notebooks than there had been 10 years, 11 years previously, um, the, 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 the first poem particularly was much, much longer. So there's a new poem in this book called The Hut, which is, I think it's more than 70 pages long, which, yeah, it's 76 pages long, which is kind of a, a doozy for me. I didn't think it would be that long, but um, there you go. So that's what I was doing over the um, confinements and um, the, the staying at home period of um, what we hope will have been the worst of COVID. And there's a, an additional smaller poem at the end called The Tiny Notebooks of Night. So um, I'm just going to read you a little bit from the hut so you have a taste. And the way it looks on the page is kind of particular. It's centered, and it's got um, a seam down the middle, or a ongoing caesura. And I've chosen to not sort of um, emphasize this caesura in my reading because it, it feels awkward, but I think it inflects the reading in some way, nevertheless. This is how writing became the story of my body. Other bodies spoke in the breaths of my body. They expanded beneath my shoulder blades. In the long duration of my next breath, writing burned on the surface of my breasts, swimming into the ocean, which was also a kind of writing. More and more I slipped under the surface, even if failing. The sheer massiness of writing is a force of cohesion. Then a quiet thought arrives, making me shyly happy. At least my sadness is my own. I walked through the waist-high wheat and it flowed like green water. I only wanted to know about love and solitude, to receive them to the core. And I am so tired of the furniture of psychology, cumbersome, dark, inherited things, smelling of dust and futile calculation. Next, the scent of the rain arrives, and then the rain, and then the com communications are undone, and doves return, and the great ecstasy of sleep in afternoon. All space is symbolic space. The plums drop into the swimming pool. I'm 52. Soft, sweet, crooked, void musk of earth as Venus rises. Because of this, I need a lot of solitude. Fix hard on trees and the desire to be useless. Loved 
and lost at once together when to love is to have lost and to be lost is to love. Love's lost ever limbed, elemental love, elemental loss have to be together at once liminal and ever. Practice loving now. A white butterfly floats past. I think of Mallarmé. Psyche is a book. The young girl glancing downwards in the attitude of reflection. She shows in her reflection the strict geometry of her hair part, downward pointing, a horizon rotated. It is a vertical horizon. In the girl, the horizon has rotated. What will endure in a sign? I wanted to experience form as duration, like a hairpin marking a page, like everything pure that I started in my long youth, all self-serious and heartbroken. The time I went crazy when my dog ran into the forest. For four days I walked through wheat fields crying, the green wheat parting below my breast bone. Every butterfly that obliquely passed was a girl in a dress. Maybe reading is about this vast desire for the invisible. My breath, my house, my twin, my equal, my absolute contemporary adored one. Sometimes the sun vibrates when, it, when I pass its open window. I wore a dress of thought-colored velvet, a little worry-toned top to embrace a seventh-century error. From Poitiers by train to Angoulême, I listened to time, all folded and pooled, kimono-like. All things pleased me. Here there were many rose bushes, therefore haruspication of rose bushes pleached. This trellis my lined notebook in air cool and exquisite and impersonal to affirm the active presence of the future in the rose bush in current living, contradictory and true, fair and fine, humble and frank. Frankly, any woman's exile. She's exile or immigrant, bent over to drink and admire, bent over rhyme, that is, mirroring water, echoing air, studying the long survival of classicism in Africa, from which humanism, medieval, was to draw its strength. I'm feeling myself as its character, my small breasts pendulous over the round table, my feet in flat sandals, my dog at rest in weeds, flies converging in the glass of sweet wine. Geometry isn't dead. The entire European tradition of spontaneous introspection bends over the round table as my little breasts. I suddenly sense with a clear truthfulness nothing is lost or abandoned. There's just a tiny little bit I want to finish with. I didn't want to read very much, but there was a fragment that um, I wanted to read for Derek, but I didn't, um, I didn't mark it. Ah, it's 2014, the year Coolidge comes to Paris. I want the fashion blogs to speak philosophy and still be the fashion blogs. <laughs> I have that marked too. Okay, good. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Uh, I'm so glad you read from that poem. This poem is fantastic. And did everyone catch that thought colored? I can't get over that you describe something as thought colored. <laughs> I have no way to think about that properly, but. You know, in my mind, it's kind of like a taupey mousy color. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I was looking around thinking, oh, I, I, to me, I, maybe this is it for me right now. I was thinking, what kind of thoughts am I having? Maybe it changes. 
Yeah, like a mood ring. Yes. <laughs> um, I do. I, I I do love this long poem, and the scene is incredible. The scene that now I want to talk to you about the writing of the book. Um, it's so interesting thinking of it as a scene. It's an invisible scene in a way, which is very couture. Uh, but also, I thought it's like not a French scene. <laughs> oh, I guess I guess it is. It's a. Uh, there, I, I tried to think of a number of ways to describe it, and I came up with a number of ways. So it's so evocative. Um, and also, it's, everything's beautifully centered on the page, which is my dream. I love things that are centered on the page. And prose writers don't get to do that. Well, you could just do it anyways. I know. I, I did it in Castle, because I, I love the thought of my paragraphs looking like chandeliers, and it's very hard when you align left. There's some That's fucked up looking beautiful. <laughs> I should say that lots of people helped me make these, I'll call them chandelier-esque. Um, Chandeliric. <laughs> Chandeliric, <laughs> yeah. Um, which is, first of all, I had the idea of making the scene, but I didn't technically know how to do it on my laptop. I'm not very advanced in, I just use Word. So a friend in Vancouver, um, um, Kay um, Higgins um, made the scene for me in the whole, in the entire poem. Um, she, um, she's, she, Kay Higgins is, is um, the co-publisher of Publication Studio in Vancouver. So she has a long practice of making books and figuring out problems. So she did that for me. And then uh, Ralph Colaway, who's here tonight, who edited this book with me for the press. Um, he helped me refine it a great deal. And uh, Crystal um, Sigma went through a million sets of proofs with me as I um, tried to adjust it to. So it, it really is a handmade scene, but not only by me. No, I, I'm, I'm curious to, I'm very curious to hear how you did it because it, 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 it looks so, it's so symmetrical. Um, and yet there are, if there are periods in some of the lines, some of the lines have more, I mean it's kerned really beautifully so it looks like a mirror image, it's not exactly. But how, so when you typed it in, was it, did you? I didn't type it in like you this. Didn't. I didn't know how to do, well okay, first of all, as you can imagine when the poem is long, it, or let's say when I work in long forms, I work in sort of um, stages where I sort of perform some sort of um, activity, compositional function across the, all of the material. And then I sit back for a while. And then I decide, okay, what am I going to do to it next? Right. What am I going to do to it next? So the poem went through, you know, about four sort of layers of, of different kinds of intervention. So I only gradually arrived at the idea of the scene. I centered it. it. It started out being left justified. Then I centered it. Because I like that cheesy look, and I've never done that before. And I just thought, you know, I, I, want, I just wanted to see how it looked out of a sense of personal perversity. And I, I thought, I probably <laughs> won't keep it that way. Um, but I really liked it. But it felt like it hadn't quite clicked yet. And I, I read that. Um, I read the verse um, in the little fragment I just read for you, which made me think of adding this scene, which is um, the young girl glancing downwards in the attitude of reflection. She shows in her reflection the strict geometry of her hair part, downward pointing, a horizon rotated. It is a vertical horizon. In the girl, the horizon has rotated. So I suddenly I thought again of this this um, stanza, which you know I'd already worked on quite a bit, and thought, ah, the poem needs the hair part, part. yeah, the center part that is you know quite chic for young girls at the moment to have the tightly pulled back hair a little bit, and I thought I'm I'm going to I'm going to part this poem. And then, having done it, I realized it was a scene. I'm so jealous. I just can't, like, I wish I had thought of it. I, I mean, I, I saw it, and it's so many things, and it does so many things, and uh, it's fantastic. So, I, I'm glad you had the moment of, like, this is going to be a part.
hard and this is going to work and we can keep it centered. That was sort of very exciting. It, it was, it was exciting. It was, and it was exciting when Kay Higgins said, oh, I can do that. Oh, yeah. Just send it over. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I know. I, you know, I'm still a cutter and paster. You know, I don't take an exacto knife and a ruler. <laughs> oh, I'm with you. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, yeah. And, and, then, and then Ralph helped me understand what it is that Kay had done so that I could continue because once it went from manuscript to uh, a designed page, um, many, many, many lines had to be rewritten um, because they were too long. Right. So you can't have any wraparound in this, obviously. So um, there was loads of rewriting that happened at this point. I also love that this poem, A Cup, has been trans because of the scene is now A Cup, as in Roy A Cup, one of my favorite country singers. I looked at him. Can you Please sing it? Can you sing it? If someone can get me a drink, I can get um, But I want, okay, so I want to ask you about uh, an indexical reading of your notebooks. Yeah, that sounds a little bit fancy. But here's what I meant. Okay. Um, when I began this project, the first poem that I wrote was called, it was the one that's second in the book now, and it's called Face. And um, at this time, I was living in Vancouver, and the um, special collections, the contemporary literature collection at Simon Fraser University Library, which is my old school, which I didn't quite graduate from, but that's another story. They wanted to um, take on my archive. And it was a very surprising proposition for me. I was, you know, just over 40. It seemed, wasn't the sort of thing that was in my mind as a, you know, to my mind that's happened to writers when they're 80 or something. You know. So I said yes because I was on the brink of moving to France. So it was a good place to put all this stuff rather than having to ship it or burn it or something. But. When I was deciding what to include in the um, archival material, I had to decide whether or not I would include my notebooks. And I have a really close relationship with my notebooks. Um, and they're not, um, generally speaking, they're not really very diaristic. Um, and yet they feel intimate to me, nevertheless. Because um, they are intimate. And they, the library wanted my notebooks, and I thought, well, I'll um, reread them to see if, you know, see what I think. And I thought, well, if I'm going to reread all this material, I'm going to make a project out of it, because, you know, um, I, I, why not? It seemed like an interesting, and I had been reading Rousseau and, and Montaigne and, and St. Augustine, and was interested in autobiography. And um, so I decided that while I reread all my notebooks, I would pull out all of the, all of the sentences with um, the, the pronoun I in them. But because they were not particularly confessional, really, there were not really very many sentences with I, and many of them were citations from something else, um, somebody else's I. Right. So I, um, I constructed a poem on those citations, and I constructed a way of doubling it um, to make a, a sort of um, a rhyming structure in a sense. So each line repeats, but irregularly. Ha having done that, I did decide to send my books to the library, okay. my, my um, notebooks. But um, I always re have regretted it ever since. So I'm, that will never happen again. But, but what I got out of it that was positive was this poem called Face that um, it was initially I thought of as well as you know, using this opportunity of rereading my work to make it. It was thought of as a response to Lynn Higinian's long poem, My Life, for a, um, a special issue of a journal coming out in DC called Ariel okay. that Rob's, Rod Smith published around Lynn Eugenia's work, so responses and um, responses to Lynn Eugenia's work. So it was published in that context, but I really enjoyed the process I had gone through to make that poem. So I just, 
And Meredith um, Quartermain asked me for a manuscript for a chapbook. So I decided to repeat the process of rereading the notebooks to make a second poem to accompany Face. And that was a poem that's in here too, and it's called Utopia. And so at this point, the notebooks were in the library, so I had to go oh. to the library and read my notebooks, which was super humiliating. Because oh. there's so many interesting things in that special collections that you can read. And here I was like, reading my own. <laughs> I'm my biggest fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, I have lots of friends in Vancouver, so they come in and say, oh, what are you doing? And like, Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so I wrote a second poem, and the second one, um, I wasn't going to, you know, look for a pronoun again. I decided to look for all the sentences that had to do with um, place or sight. And um, that, um, so that one was much longer, because all, already I was interested in, in, in that, that sort of topic, and I called it Utopia. And then, you know, I just kept, do, and then I thought the project was finished, and then I did do more a few years later. So it's, it's a project where I just keep coming back to the initial idea of choosing a very small filtering device um, to, um, um, as a kind of point of contact, point of contact, as an in, in, in indexical point. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm, in a sense, I'm taking a, an imprint of the notebooks, but from a very limited um, um, point of view. Right. And um, it's just become more and more interesting to me as a process. And, and also, the, I was very, very strict about it when I was writing the earlier poems. Strict about my rule, my constraint. But by the time I was writing Cut, like last year, I just I kept on changing my mind about what the <laughs> what the rules were what the rules were as I was doing it and that felt much more pleasurable um, and then I and then I, I needed something to make it sort of cohere so I decided okay this is the poem of morning because morning as in the time of, of day because I my habit was to to write this was getting up pretty early like you know six or something and just working for a good couple of hours before breakfast. So I, 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 I did some changing, some finagling um, after the fact to kind of turn it into the poem of morning and it, it opens with the sunrise. I'm so glad that you broke the rules because I, when I'm writing I, I have rules about if, it, if there's a two line sentence has to be followed by a four line which then has to be followed by a one or a five. And but I, five I break it all the time. Yeah, I, make I, it up as I, go along. I think that's the only use of constraints is the, the pleasure of, um, of transgressing them. Yeah, and it feels just right. There's some yeah. rightness to it. Yeah, that and it's like, changes. it's my rule, I can break it. <laughs> now, I'm excited to be talking to you about this because I, I just did a long conversation with Wayne Kostenbaum about his uh, last three books of poetry, which he called from notebooks. Oh, okay. Now, he did not call it an indexical reading, though I think that's a very elegant way to say it. Um, his was more a cruising. He went back in and saw oh, bits that turned him on, yeah. uh, or that felt flirtatious or, uh -huh. or sexual. Um, and, but I th still, I think the indexical is a, a great way to say it. I think I caught this word from artist friends. You did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was working on Liz Magor, who does um, makes molds and makes sculptural work with. Um, um, casting from molds yeah. that she constructs from actual objects. So it's a kind of technical term in, uh, in, in, okay. in casting from molds. The, the point of contact between the mold and the, 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 cast, uh, the cast form is, is, is an indexical contact. The first thing I thought was purse, Charles Sanders purse. Oh, I've mm -hmm. heard of that guy, but I've never read it. Well, it, it struck me that his name is Purse, so yeah. I gotta use that somehow. Okay. I mean, that's the greatest <laughs> name for a linguist, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I did look up Ben Denise at Index, because I know you are fond. I love <laughs> <laughs> So I wanna ask you more about that, but first I wanna say, so one thing about Wayne was he was very strict about a certain old skin size, a certain color. I have a sense that you were less strict. Oh yeah, no. My uh, the the earlier notebooks are more interesting because moleskins didn't really exist as far as I know, and maybe 
you know, the early ones go back to the late 80s. Right. And at that point, I was buying notebooks quite often in Chinatown in Vancouver, and they had beautiful silk, um, silk sort of brocade notebooks with um, sewn, uh, hand sewn bindings and um, cheap paper on the inside. They, these were inexpensive, but you could get these black silk brocade or hot pink silk brocade. So a lot of the early ones were at that. And then, and then there were notebooks that were Japanese that I used to get from Sharon Ewan, who was a Vancouver artist who had a paper shop. I think we called Paper Yacht, okay. I'm not sure, on Granville Island. And I used to go and buy notebooks from her, but she had these kind of, you, you do see these around now. They, they say something on the cover like, gives best writing quality. <laughs> but the nice thing about them is they come in different size, sizes, and I like to have a little one to keep in my, in my purse, and uh, bigger ones for working in libraries and stuff. But now I mostly use moleskins or some kind of German kind that's not quite a moleskin, but similar. Right. But no, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm um, promiscuous. I was going to say, <laughs> you're more promiscuous in the way you notebook wise. <laughs> um, that makes sense to me. I mean, the, the, the moleskin dictated for him the length of the sentences. And, but when I was reading this, you did mention an olive notebook, uh, an embossed notebook. Yeah. You mentioned different inks, black ink. I like that sort of archival thing of describing the describing the document. It, yeah. it's, um, it's kind of pleasurable and, and yeah. Uh, it's beautiful to read and it's very, I know it's about mourning, but it is very mournful. Like it's really about time passing and... Uh, yeah. um, at this age, you know, people have died. And yeah. when you're sitting up at six o'clock in the morning in the dark, you're, you're talking to those people. Yeah, and we have been very sick ourselves. Uh, yeah. And yeah. so that haunts me too. Yeah, um, so it's, it's, it's a bit too real, but there it is. You yeah. know? I but used to be much more cavalier and fuck off and <laughs> about the other thing, but now it's like, I don't want to think of that death. Right. Well, at some point I felt you became Lucretian in the, in the poem, which I think is like a great response to death, because that's that's a no fear of death, the Epicurean tradition. And, yeah. And yeah. I thought that was really moving. Um, I'm not sure that I actually um, psychologically um, can continuously stay in that position. No. But I believe that that Epicurean um, um, fearlessness towards death is the um, ideal position. Well, then I thought, is this scene the Klinerman? I thought, is this is this another? Maybe. I mean, Maybe. yeah. Why not? Sure. Um, I want to get back to the big question though, which is fashion blogs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sad there are hardly any blogs anymore. It was just a, a moment of blogs that was, you know, er, sort of, in my recollection, 2004 until 2008 was the great moment of blogs. Mm -hmm. But it might have gone on a bit longer than that. But now there's like Instagram, there's not blogs. Right. But I used to go and look at, I was a big fan of Susie Bubble. Right. Um, um, I used to read a lot of knitting blogs. Oh. <laughs> I took up knitting for a little while as a kind of calming thing. And I would knit on airplanes and it was just a, you know, and I didn't knit anything that had very good. Except I knitted Hadley some little fingerless gloves. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. I discovered that little little things are, are good because you can finish them. But so I was reading knitting blogs, which was a whole genre, and I found out there are a lot of like wacko mathematicians who who, who knit um, you know <laughs> fractal formulae. <laughs> and I got laid off on this this big sort of side loop from fashion blogs into kind of mathematical knitting, uh, you know. No, I didn't do it. Right. I just, I just read it. Do you still knit? No. So and that's you know, probably not a good thing, you know, that people should knit and do everything. But I garden a lot. I'm big into gardening. Yes, that comes across in the book very strongly that you are, although, we, does anyone know what this is? This is 
said chrysanthemums. So knitting never gave you the deep peace that it was supposed to? What I discovered in knitting is that I'm not good at counting. Okay. Because if you follow a pattern, which I had to do because I, I, I don't have native skills as a knitter, um, you have to be able to count. And my mind is always going off. And so, you know, to get to, if you have to cast on 93 stitches, that is very challenging. <laughs> I know nothing about knitting except that I, I love buying booklets from the 30s and 40s and 50s with how to make money at home booklets. And there's often yeah. little, I think it's important for a writer maybe to learn things like stuffing squirrels, <laughs> counting, yeah. making fingers. Really, I don't have to count higher than 14 as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, if I can go back to, to the hut for a second, what determines the what determines the diagonal slashes? What divides that? Can I ask you a really technical question? Yeah, yeah. It. Um, Speaking of counting, because I didn't yeah. go through a count lines or anything. Yeah, no, there's there's no counting. Um, in, this is count free. Okay. This is freestyle. <laughs> um, there seemed to be, as I was writing this, well, first of all, I wrote it all into a big notebook. Okay. That had a green cover notebook about this. And so that's what I was doing in the morning, just transcribing from all the little notebooks into the big notebook. And I tended to, um, sometimes I would make a stanza break when I finish notes from one notebook. Sometimes, you know, at the end of the morning's work, it was intuition with a few sort of rational, rationally derived pauses. Then when I went to transcribe that into a computer file much later, I was getting a feeling that there were two different kinds of breaks. There was like a little stanza break and a big stanza break. And um, I was reading at the time, I was rereading Clark Coolidge's wonderful book, The Crystal Text, and he had these two kinds of breaks. Okay. And he used a, a dark dot to separate um, some um, some sort of chunks of lighter stanza break right. um, sequences. And so basically I thought, oh, I'm going to copy um, Clark Coolidge. Why not? Um, it's a brilliant book, The Crystal Text. Um, and I just love that sort of returning every day to the desk. And he looked at his crystal. I looked at my notebooks. But anyways. So obviously once um, the seam went into the poem, you couldn't the, the dot didn't work. Okay, right. So, um, Alana suggested um, the double slash. Alana. Because at, at, po at different points in this book, I do use slashes, like at the end of, at the end of individual poem titles, and I think there are a couple more here and there. So Alana suggested the double slash, um, and it was perfect. Right. I thought. Yeah, it is. I, so, I that's, that's what we did. Of course, it doesn't interrupt the scene. Right? Yeah, yeah, you get to, it, it gets to keep running through. It's like two little Margiela stitches. Right on. On the page. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and is the project done? Well, what I discovered as I was doing this is that, roughly speaking, in a kind of loose way, I've been returning to doing this every 10 years. Okay. So I first did it when I was 40, then I did it when I was roughly 50, and now 60. So it occurs to me that if I don't croak, it could be interesting to do it when I'm 70. I had never previously imagined doing a project that I return to every 10 years. It just sort of, that was sort of like the rough breakdown as I was doing this, and the timing for this was just Alana's and my discussion about um, what we wanted to do, and um, um, I had in mind to do this project before I wrote the Baudelaire Fractal, um, but Alana thought it would be good to do the novel, and then I got some prize money, surprisingly, awesome. which is how I could afford to sit at home and write the Baudelaire Fractal. 
Um, and so it just kind of happened that, you know, we did all that and got the book out. And then by the time I started this, I was, I was um, 60. Shocking. But you're, so, you're, so, so now I'm thinking, once I realized, okay, yeah, I did that three times over 20 years, it could be really interesting to do it again when I'm 70. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Baudelaire Fractal because I, I think that was the last time I saw you was just when the pandemic was bearing down on us. Yeah. Um, and I saw you being interviewed. And it's interesting reading this book specifically The Hut because uh, Baudelaire is mentioned, of course, but also you become Rambeau. Oh yeah, there's a few little Rambo breakaway scenes, yeah. But they're very effective and touching and, sh and very Kathy Acker-esque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it works beautifully and it did make me think, were you experimenting? What were you doing in your notebooks, becoming different people? Who else did you become? Um, Hard to say, you know, that's kind of private. <laughs> <laughs> but that, it, I should also say that one thing about that shocked, shocked me about Wayne's books is that he put in loads of names of people he didn't know. Uh, he mentioned Bradley Cooper six times, and I said, are you hot for Bradley Cooper? So I have no idea who that person is. <laughs> but your, the properties you mentioned are very specific, I think, and meaningful to you. There, this is what there I are people like, well, to tell you the truth, I haven't really read much Rambo. Okay. I'm not like, not so Rambo, but I'm interested in Rambo as being this kind of pop idol. Yeah. You know, yep. and in the in other poems I've mentioned like some supermodel names like Kate Moss and I, I I like the sort of you know trashy pop culture sort of and I always think of Rainbow that way. Yeah, fair but enough. I think also like didn't didn't Patty Smith like buy Rainbow's house or something? Yeah, she bought it wherever it is or it's some moved like to. you know trashy hovel. Like these villages are not cute. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing with So her. maybe it was that, you know, maybe yeah. I'd heard about, it, so maybe that's how Rambo popped in, and then I, I sort of pushed it a little bit more. But there's some, like, living friends, like it ends by mentioning Monica de la Torre, right. um, who's a fabulous um, Mexican-American poet, lives in New York. Teaches in New York. Yeah, I think yeah. she, I yeah. don't think she has a, I don't know where she teaches okay. right now. She was teaching at Brown, but she might be teaching somewhere else now. But she's love, just a lovely person and a yeah. great writer. And then there's philosophers who I read, and I like to pop their name. Well, Rambo makes sense, the pop idol, because he's immediately described his coat and his pants, which I love. His midi kumos. Yes, yes. <laughs> you get an immediate sense of his silhouette there. Good. Um, but I do want to ask about Ben Benice, who means a lot to you. Yeah. Yeah, um, he's, um, well, he's, you know, he's a, a French linguist who died in 1976, who was trained in a um, pre-structuralist Saussurean tradition in the 20s and became, in the teens and 20s, and became um, um, part of the um, surrealist movement and part of a um, pacifist um, anti-colonial movement. And um, as he was doing this, learned like 37 languages, including high type or something oh, like this. That. Yeah, he's like, he's, 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 um, he's amazing. But not only because he knows high type. Um, I started, I don't know why I started reading him. What, what would it, oh, I know, I know. I was, I was translating um, Henri Mechenique, um, a, a more recent linguist, also passed away, um, because Henri Mechenique has um, theories of rhythm. And um, I was writing more about meter and rhythm in relationship to some of my essays on sound and listening. And um, a friend in Paris, a Scottish um, poet, and teacher named Jeff Gilbert, who I've known for eons, who always calls me on my bullshit, said, <laughs> if you're going to talk about meter, maybe you should know something about it. <laughs> oh. Read Mechenique. And I, there are not very many people I obey. Right. Jeff is one of them. One of them. And um, 
So I, I read Nishnik and I was teaching at this time in California and teaching a class on listening and sound and, and listening as a practice. And this would have been you know, 2008 or something. And so I wanted to assign Nishnik to my students um, and discovered that the English language translations really, really, really sucked. They made it so difficult and so opaque and so uninteresting. And so I set out to make some translations of Meshanik um, so that my students would want to read him. And um, in the process of translating and reading Meshanik, I learned that one of his great masters was uh, Benveniste. And Benveniste has an essay on rhythm that to me has become sort of like a core hymn in my, um, in my intellectual and emotional life, right. where he completely opens up and expands and, and embellishes <laughs> the idea of what rhythm can be. So it totally moves away from the idea of like a measured beat to be something else. Right. So I won't get into a whole lecture right. about Benveniste. But that, rereading that essay of his over the years um, blew my mind a and of course, I started reading other essays and um, was almost as blown away by essays he wrote on the use of pronouns right. and on subjectivity. And then um, around um, um, 15 years ago, I guess, uh, yeah, 14, between, you know, around that, a little while back, um, his notes on Baudelaire were being published in facsimile, and it was a totally fetishistic, um, sort of um, his handwritten notes and uh, a typographical transcription of the notes, big wacky book like this. And he had been working on an essay on Baudelaire's poetics that turned, that was invited by, he was invited to write it by um, Roland Barthes, and um, he had a stroke before he could turn his notes into the book that it actually was becoming. Right. So no essay was ever published, nor did he get to write his book. But um, a young scholar named Chloé Lapontine, I think who had been a student of Bonvenis, I mean uh, of Mechanix at Paris Wheat, um, took on this project, the, the transcription of the Benvenis of the Benvenis Baudelaire notes. Wow. So I started translating that, and you know, I do lectures on this stuff when I'm asked to do lectures, in, often in the US, because it gives me a, 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 a little window of chance to learn more. Yeah. And also, I feel nobody reads him nearly enough. He's very, very well known and respected in France, where it's totally accepted and understood that he's the key influence for Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, Barthes. Lacan, etc. But in Anglophone contexts, it's not really the case at all. There's like it's he's a he's a special right. special taste, right. and so it, it just gives me something to do that I enjoy. Um, well, I enjoy seeing the kinship, and that's how I got into Baudelaire, though. Yeah, wow. that's wow. how I ended wow. up into the whole Baudelaire thing that turned into the Baudelaire fractal, was because I was translating Benveni's notes on Baudelaire, so it's like better read the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so you get a very rich vein. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Elena, we've been talking, I love talking to Lisa, but I know it's been a while. I have no idea how long. Oh, no, it, I mean, I could hear, I could listen to you guys all day. I feel like if, you know, they ask you who would be your dream dinner party, I think that you two would be happy to be <laughs> But I just want to make sure we give the audience Of course, yes, 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 yes. People. Does anyone want to ask any questions? You have chrysanth or chrysanthemums oh, yeah. match your socks. Is the <laughs> <laughs> I feel that someone said, oh, Elena, you said that we were fashion plates, but only Lisa is a fashion plate tonight. Look at your bracelet. I am wearing my grandmother's charm bracelet. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. I, I rarely wear it, but I thought I was wearing a cowboy shirt and jeans, so I butchered up with this um, <laughs> Woolworths charm bracelet. <laughs> um, no, but Lisa looks 
it, it have a, has a Romeo Gigli vibe for me. If that's a good it, thing to say or not. It's a sort of fake Romeo. <laughs> Uh, no, it's exciting. I love Romeo, but none of this is Romeo. Who, who knows or where's Romeo? You never see Romeo mentioned. You never see it in the online vintage shops. I heard gossip about him. Oh. He was married to a major um, fashion editor in oh, Italy, yeah. like who was the editor of Italian Vogue, who had a lot of power. Okay. And they had a very ugly divorce. Oh. And she destroyed his career. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Like set as his, her party gift. Uh, I hear that about fashion. I heard that about um, oh, Marco Zanini after he left Scaparelli in a very bad terms. It was like, you're never going to be in a magazine again. And he yeah. wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't. So Luckily, I'm, poetry's not like that. Alana has that power in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> she has the same power, so watch it. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody? Oh, there's Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Derek. How was your day? <laughs> Do you have any questions, Kyle? Well, I I should probably have a question for Lisa. No offense, but I, I do see you often. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Kyle. Um, I was thinking about um, the because because you're talking about how uh, this is a project you keep coming back to, and that, um, and uh, I was thinking about uh, when we first met which you may or may not remember. Uh, this is also a question that might only be interesting to me. But um, <laughs> the, you were writing, I think it was like it was like the very early 2000s, and you were writing, I think, um, uh, among other things, like the beginnings of the architect, the soft office, the, ar the architecture stuff. Right. You were also writing, I think, a newspaper column oh, about yeah. how home works. Oh yeah, that thing that was in the Globe and Mail for a while, that was an interesting, um, yeah, they had, the Globe and Mail had a weekly column called How Poems Work. That's what I had for And they got a different, <laughs> each poet who they asked to do it got um, four columns, so a month's worth of work, and you picked a short poem and wrote uh, a short um sort of way into the poem. Yeah, what I, what I, what I remember like, loving about the columns that you wrote were these particularly bizarre little parts of a poem you would take it out, you would, you would pinpoint to use as your entrance point. And then I thought like, you know, if, if, Lisa, if, if Lisa then had to write like, you know, a how the poem, how a poem works column about this work now, like <laughs> what's the, what's the like the weird, like, you know, sidearm pitch that you would use as like a way into this Work that we have never thought of before. No Don't you ask me an easy, charming question? <laughs> I, I really don't know what to. You mean a, the, just the hut, or you mean a boat? Well, I didn't think the question through that well. <laughs> yeah, I, so I'm doing that thing of, of answering the hard question with a sort of unrelated side question. It's correct. <laughs> Well, let me just say that to me, when I chose the way to begin to discuss the poems for the Globe and Mail, it all seemed very obvious to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't choosing some kind of quirky, weirdo way in. I was just like, okay, here we go. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, well, but I, I, yeah, I, I, did, good days. I didn't finish my English BA, so. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Yeah, yeah um, both Clark Coolidge and the fashion plots. And that uh, I, I, I know you're, you're very fond of, of uh, Coolidge's writing, but it just struck me like that coincidence of fashion plots and Clark Coolidge is just so uh, paratactic in a way. Or was did you talk to Clark Coolidge about fashion plots when he was in Paris? No, absolutely not. All of this is completely synthesized. Ah, uh -huh. um, perhaps lines along those, uh, perhaps, I don't know how that turned out. I, you know, I, I can't account for these. Uh, I was barely awake when I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking through old notebooks and sort of pulling pieces across from one, you know, I, one, one 
bit might have been from 20 years ago and joining it to something from the previous month. That was, that's sort of the interest of it to me, is like you know, I'm sort of building thoughts or associations that I actually have not had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So composing the poem gives me the opportunity to uh, have a, a um, stimulating new thought. <laughs> Such as Coolidge and fashion blogs. <laughs> but I, I definitely I wasn't representing a thought that I, I had had previously. And, um, yeah. So it's, it, it is completely paratactic, but that to me it seems like a thought. I like the definition of a sentence as being a complete thought. Yes. But maybe a complete thought might have a 15 year hiatus part way through before you. <laughs> return to complete it. And that's to me what the gorgeous thing about writing is, that we have the privacy to, um, um, to experience the 15 year hiatus in the middle of a thought. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's call it a day. I think that's, oh, was there another question? Sure. Oh, Charlie. Yeah, uh, Clark Woods is a drummer. Right. Yeah. Uh, so does that particular kind of rhythm, because uh, he, I think, was in David Meltzer's band, does that have any anything to do with what you were thinking about rhythm? No. I, I've heard Clark Coolidge um, perform with, um, um, who's the guy from Sonic Youth? There's I heard him perform with Thurston Moore in Paris. Uh, no, it wasn't. In, maybe it was in Paris. Yeah, yeah, it was. And it was interesting, but um, I, I'm not like a, a, a thorough, you know, hugely knowledgeable scholar of Clark Coolidge's whole practice. Um, and I haven't read all of his work. Um, I have a kind of obsessive compulsive relationship to reading the crystal text. Like that's the Coolidge for me. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I will think I should read something else and I try and it's like, yeah, this is not the crystal text. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got the big fat reader from the uh, type books, uh -huh. sale books. Great. Cart out front for five bucks. I, I think he's all good. Um, I think I'm going to read his early work on geology, maybe I'll, which the crystal text is kind of related to. Mm -hmm. I'm the rhinestone text. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that both Derek and Lisa would be happy to sign books. Maybe you don't mind sitting here for a minute and if anyone wants to get a book signed, they would be happy to do that. Um, thank you so much for coming to our first and not last in-person event. Um, and thank you for being respectful of the art and the mass and all of that. Um, welcome back, I guess, to literary uh, in-person thing. And thank you so much for a fantastic conversation. Um, so it's such a delight. I hope you all felt the same way. So thank you so much. Can we please thank you. Can we give them a call?